Well, good afternoon, and I want to welcome you back for another session of family members dealing with uh, family members being addicted to uh, drugs. And what a difficult uh, circumstance that is to put you in, what, what it uh, causes the addict to go through, what it causes you to go through, what it causes the rest of the family to go through. Because the matter of the fact is that addiction affects the entire family. And that can extend even to children that are grown and married. And one of their parents is in addiction. Because it does impact you. It impacts people that care about you. And the reason it does is it's very difficult to watch someone destroy themselves. And when someone is in addiction, that's exactly the trail they're on is destruction, destruction of themselves. God doesn't want us to do that. God tells us that our body is a temple. And that we should not damage the temple. If we damage the temple, God will destroy the temple. That's scriptural. But today I want to, I want to try to focus on when the family is dealing with a situation when the member suffering from addiction seems to be at a stalemate. You see, we, we have uh, this method that we go by called the 12 steps. And you go through and you look at it, and the first one always has to be first. And that is, you have to admit that you have a problem. From there, the steps may not come in order. And every person that is in addiction is not going to recover at the same pace. They are not going to respond at the same pace. And that's where it becomes so difficult on the family because you say, I got them in, 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 in rehab now and they're doing well. But here they come to a standstill. What do I do? Well, just like until that person admitted that they had a problem, there is nothing you can do. That person's recovery is at their own pace. But what we must do as a family member is love that person. And you say, well, you've told us before that we may have to turn our back. Well, just because you turn your back or you're forced, let's rephrase that, that you're forced that you have to turn your back doesn't mean you stop loving them. You never stop loving your loved one. They can do some horrible things to you. They can hurt you. But there's not a parent alive that's going to tell me that they stopped loving their child. But that's where it's so important that they have a network of people other than yourself that they can lean on. Because that's where we as Christians come into play with everybody, with all of our fellow Americans, with all of our fellow citizens, with all the fellow population. If you are a Christian, you have to love people. And loving people means more than just doing something good for them. You see, when you love somebody, you care about them. And that caring is genuine and it's in your heart. And there's more ways to love someone than just saying, I love you. That person that's suffering with addiction, as well as the family member themselves, 
need someone to say, I'm here for you. That person that's in addiction needs someone that they can talk to. They need an outlet. There's a reason why they have reached a stalemate. And it may be because they are tired of what they're going through. And that's why it's so important that they have that leadership from someone else to guide them to don't give up. And family members, don't give up. Don't ever give up on your loved one. As long as there's breath, with Jesus Christ there is hope. There's hope for you, and there's hope for them, and there's hope for all the addicts. Now, it's just a fact of life. All addicts will never recover. Oh, what a great joy that would be to see them recover. But it's, it's not going to happen. I know I'm so excited about what's going on here at Grace Ministries because... We've got a program that we're starting or a ministry that we're starting as a community come together ministry. It may be functioning out of Grace Ministries, but it's got to be a community ministry. And that is to help people to find the resources they need to get recovery. Now, preferably it would be faith-based resources, and there are several out there, and we're even trying to raise money to help people that doesn't have funding to get the help that's needed. It's nothing more detrimental to someone than to hear a person that's in addiction say, I want help, and you feel helpless because you don't know what to do. You don't have the money to send them. Some families don't have the money to send them. Some rehab facilities are $30,000 a month. Only the rich can afford that. In Vance County, there are very few rich people. There are very few rich people that can even afford $30,000 a month in Vance County. So that's why we're trying to come together as a community and raise funds because there are places here in North Carolina that will take a person for up to 12 months for $700. There's another place that will take people for eight months for, I think it's $350. There's another place that's $250. There's some places that can even be free depending on the person's financial position, but they need someone that can help and guide them. They have been through sheer torment in dealing with their drug addiction. So I'm telling you today, if you're listening to me, whether you are a part of Grace Ministries or not, we are here to try to help you. There is no question in my mind that our community will rise to the occasion and we will come together and we will make ourselves a stronger community by helping one another. I have, I have had different ideas about this. Uh, idea, if you want to call it. And the door will close just like that. I said, well, maybe that's not God. Maybe God's not directing me there. Maybe that's something that I want to personally do. But then within a few hours, maybe even a few minutes, another door opens. And another door opens. And people say, I want to give. I want to help. What can I do to help? Our community does care. But our community has been... Uh, how do I say this, has, has had a stigma of people on drugs to where they don't know how to respond. 
They care about you, but they also don't want you stealing from them. Now, family members, I'm talking to you. Your family member may be stealing from someone. They may steal from you. Uh, I know in the recovery meeting Tuesday night, I told somebody, I said, if you need something and you ask me for it, if I can do it, I'm going to give it to you. But if you steal from me, we're going to have a problem. And I was serious about that. Because there's a way out. The family is helpless. They cannot do anything but support their family member that's in addiction. That addiction can be from alcohol to sex addiction to drug addiction, you name it. The family is helpless. They sit around and they wish that there was something they could do, but they're helpless. Have you ever been in a situation where you can't control? I know when I'm in a situation and I can control the outcome, I feel comfortable. Because I'm going to have to make a decision and I'll have to live with that decision. But it's a decision that I had the choice, the free will to make. That family member that has their person suffering from addiction does not have that. They can only hope and pray. You know, I just realized I, I didn't start out the way I needed to, but we'll finish the way I needed to. Just, just stay along with me. I didn't even open with a word of prayer. I'm so excited today. You know, I have the honor, the greatest honor, well, one of the greatest honors in the world, especially that a minister can have, to unite a, a couple in marriage. And I'm so excited about that Saturday. I'm so excited for them. I'm excited for their family. I'm excited that I have the opportunity to serve them in that way. They will be starting anew. They may have children themselves if God blesses them with them. They could be just like family members with people in addiction. It could happen to them. It can happen to any of us. Because you have a person in addiction and you may be poor, you're not alone. There are people from all economic backgrounds that have people in addiction. There are doctors. There are lawyers. There are nurses. Addiction doesn't, uh, it doesn't discriminate against a certain class of people. Some of the people with money may can hide what their loved one is going through more than some of us that don't have a lot of money. But you know what? They still have the same feelings that you do. They still have the same feelings that they are helpless when their loved one is in addiction and is not making progress. You know, the greatest or one of the greatest feelings that a that a family member can have when someone goes into addiction is when they complete a rehab program to where they have been clean for three, six, nine, twelve months, two years, whatever the case may be. But in a few cases, it still doesn't resonate with the person. And once they get released, they go right back into the same background they were in, hanging with the same people, and they take that drug again. And you may find out that they've overdosed and they've lost their life. That is so sad. But it's a fact of life. 
it does happen. But what happens more than someone finishing rehab and losing their life is someone finishing rehab and going on to put their life back together, becoming that family again that they once were, becoming the person that they were before drugs took over the control of their body. Drugs makes the addict do things that they normally wouldn't do. You've heard me say before that addicts are good people. Well, they're good people to a point, but you get the drug out of them and they're a former addict and you see some mighty nice people. People that care for other people. People that love one another. People that want to help other addicts. We have an event coming up here at church to kick off th this program I've been telling you about called A New Beginning. And I've got at least two members from our church that has agreed to share their testimony of how they recovered from drugs. One of them had shown me a picture uh, a couple of months ago where when he was in full-blown addiction, his skin was yellow. He weighed about 130 pounds. This man has been in recovery now for going on uh, 20 months. This man weighs close to 200 pounds, if not over. This man is a kind, generous man. Another man that's going to give his testimony at one point was living under bridges in Scotland Neck because he was addicted to alcohol. Both of these men, through Jesus Christ, found hope. Their family members saw what they had found. I encourage you, come out the first Saturday in October. I, can't, I don't know what date I just said, but come out the first Saturday in October. The event's going to be from 2 to 5 p.m. We're going to have some groups singing. We're going to have some food. We're going to have some congregational singing. We're just going to worship the Lord and have some community drug education, drug awareness. That is so lacking in our community. We hear people talk about the addicts and that they're no good, but we don't hear about people trying to do something for them. So help us. Let's us come together as a community now. Put our heads, put our bodies, put our souls together in helping our friends, in helping our neighbors. You know, the scripture that I'm getting ready to share with you says that we should love one another as Christ loves the church. Do you know what that means? That means that Christ loved the church, loved us so much that he gave his own life that we could have eternal life. Now, I don't think in most circumstances we are expected to lay our lives down. But we are expected to love everyone. Even that addict that may find it or make it hard to love. We don't have to look at them as if they are nobody. Because that person is somebody's child or somebody's husband or somebody's uncle. And it could be yours. It could be yours. It could be mine. They are still people. And they are people that I'm telling you, you get the drug out of them and they are just as you and I are. 
They are good, honest people. We also want to hopefully work to help people that finish rehab and haven't completed their high school education to have the opportunity to earn a GED. We have a GED program going on here. But in addition to that, if this program can grow enough, maybe we can work with people that finish their GED and wants to go to the next level and maybe earn an associate's degree or earn, learn how to do a trade. The way out of drugs, some, a lot of people are in drugs because they can't handle the pressure. If any of you have ever been in a situation where you work and you go home and you got bill collectors calling because you don't have enough money to go around, that's stress. You got kids that need things for, for school and you can't give it to them, that's stress. Those types of things can lead to drug addiction. So if we can help people gain an education, gain training to where they can get better jobs, just maybe they can make ends meet a little bit better and they won't have these stresses. They can come home from work in the evenings and rest watch TV, fish, whatever, whatever their normal protocol would be. But if we don't do something, then things will continue to deteriorate. Our community will continue to go downhill. What are you willing to do today? What are you willing to do for that family? that has someone in addiction? Are you going to shun them? Or are you going to say, well, I don't want to get too close to them. Their child may come and steal from me. That person is somebody too. And they need a friend. They need somebody to say, I care about you. One of the hardest things in the world for a parent to do is to admit that they have a child in drug addiction. It hurts them. It ashames them. And I can understand the hurt, but the ashamed should not be there because they didn't cause their person to go into addiction. We, as the other side, look at someone and we start, they're no good, their, their child's no good, i got to stay away from them. That's not love. That's not caring. That's being uh, preventative. That's being preserved. That's being just taking care of myself. And you know, that's, that's not being a Christian. Christian is caring for our fellow man. Our scripture here in the book of John 15, starting... I gotta take my glasses off to see. Starting with uh, verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another." So the Bible clearly tells us that we're to love one another. Now, I'm not telling you that you don't need to be careful. 
that there are not times that you don't need to keep your doors locked, keep your outside buildings locked. That's just common sense. But it's also common sense to say, Paul, I'm sorry for what you're going through. I wish there was something I could do to ease the pain. And you would be surprised at how that would make that person feel because they know someone cares about them. That person is still feeling ashamed, but it's less. And the more times you tell them that and the more people that tell them that, the less ashamed they're going to feel because they feel like they're not being judged. So today, we've talked about a lot, but it comes down to this. We as a family member, we can't take our person out of addiction. If we could, there would be no one in addiction. We can pray for them. We can love them. We can ask God to heal them. But our loved one has to answer that call. You as a friend can also pray for the family that has someone suffering from addiction as well as the member of the family that is in addiction. And when you see that member that is in addiction, if they are safe to be around, there is nothing wrong with telling them, I love you, brother. You can beat this. They may turn their back, but you never know when that one time that you say something, maybe not right then, maybe not a month from now, but three or four months from now, that will resonate with them. They will say, you know, that person told me they cared about me, or Jesus loves me. Who is this Jesus person? This Jesus person can heal every one of us in here can heal everybody that's out there on this video. This Jesus person is our Lord and Savior. He gave His own life for us. He went and prepared a place for us that is so great the human mind cannot comprehend. He prepared a place that is streets of gold. There are mansions. Now everybody... You stop and think there's not a person that has not gone through some kind of turmoil in their life. I wish it was, but it's really not possible, I don't think. But imagine to be in heaven and how you felt when you were going through that turmoil or when your loved one is going through that addiction. And there will be that feeling no more. You've lost a loved one to cancer. And that can be a painful, drawn-out process to watch your loved one reach their demise. See them just go down to nothing. You won't have to do that anymore. You won't have to worry about whether I've got enough money to pay my bills. Because it will be nothing but glory. Praising God. Oh, what a marvelous life that must be. I don't consider myself to have had a horrible life. There have been times I wish I didn't go through, but we did and we got through them. But I can tell you today that if something happened to me, I know where I'm going. How about you? Do you know if something happened to you driving home today, where you would spend eternity? Would you spend eternity in that place called damnation with hell and fire? Or would you spend it in glory where there's nothing but happiness? I know what my choice is, and I know how to make that choice. Everybody, please listen to me for just a minute and we'll close. No matter where you're at in your life, no matter what you've been through, 
If you don't have Jesus in your life, call on Him right now. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I am a sinner. Jesus, I need you in my life. Jesus, I can't do any more than what I'm doing. I can't do anything with my loved one. Well, whether you're a Christian already, God, if you pray that prayer, God can give you the contentment to help you get through this period of time. And if you're not a Christian, He can still do the same thing. You accept Him in your heart as your Savior. And He becomes your Lord. You find yourself doing things that you normally haven't been doing in the past. You find yourself caring for people in ways you never thought possible. You know, here at Grace Ministries, we have a, a, a saying, you walk through our door and you're just as good as anybody in that church or just as good as anybody out on the street. No one is going to judge you. I can't promise you that will never happen. But if they judge somebody, they're not going to be around long because that's not the way we do things. We look at everybody. There's a young man right now that I'm trying to work with, trying to help him get the help that he needs. He knows he has a problem. He admitted to me that he has a problem. And we're working on trying to get him help. But he has made some choices that is making that means more difficult than what it had to be. But he told me last Friday night, he said, you know, this may be the best thing that ever happened to me. I'm looking at things in a different way. God works in mysterious ways. He loves us all. He wants us all to come to Him. And He will receive us. Ask for forgiveness. Accept Him in your heart. And you are forgiven. Whether that's a drug addict, drug dealer, murderer, it doesn't matter. That's your past. When you accept Christ as your Savior, He forgets your past. Other people may not, but Christ does. So today, I'm going to beg you. If you're not a Christian, please make that decision today to trust Him. Let Him come in your life and do a work. It won't be all easy, but you'll find your life gets better every day that you live. You will find that He will give you contentment when you turn things over to Him because He is the Lord of Lords. He is omnipotent. He is powerful. He can do anything. Us ourselves, we're basically powerless. But with God and through God, anything can be accomplished. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time together. I know this message has been more directed towards the community than to the, the poor people that have family members in addiction. But Lord, it's, it's an avenue that has to be covered. It's an avenue that we as a community must grow together and must work together and must use your wisdom and your talents that you have given us so that we can see an improvement. We can see people coming to you. We can see people getting off drugs. We can see families becoming families again. Lord, if there's someone here that has not or does not know you as their Savior, please put that burden on their heart to accept you today. Lord, life is, is entirely different. When you look to you, Lord, you give us answers. If we have a problem, Lord, you give us a way out. So Jesus, 
please call on their hearts. Congregation, please answer that call today. Become a child of God. For this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I want to say one more thing. Becoming a Christian does not give you all the answers. It may not make your family member turn around like that. It may not even convert them at all. But it's going to help you. And you can only control yourself. You can't control anyone else. So today, come to Jesus and let Jesus do a work in your life. Thank you.